Yeah, uh, it's good to be here. I was at East Bay Meditation Center in 2009 in person with Bonnie Duran. Um, I have not uh, been back, so I'm really ha happy to be here. Uh, my name, Jeff Houses, is an Apache name, meaning uh, pulling up as if pulling a plant, uprooting a plant versus breaking it off at the ground. It's pronounced Hayuzos or Hauzos. Apache, and a mixed race. My dad was Chiricahua Apache, and my mom was white of Anglo descent, Welsh, Irish, Scottish, but I identify as Apache. And, you know, like the Buddha, our people, the Apache people, didn't have written language before contact with Westerners. It was all oral. Uh, they had an or oral tradition, and they used stories to communicate their history and beliefs and values. And when the days got shorter and the weather got cold, they would tell coyote stories. I was driving in here from the canyon in which I live, and it was 37 degrees when I left. And I also passed a skunk and a, and a deer. But 37 degrees. And so this is the time of year that, that the kids would gather around and the, the parents would tell stories about the, about the coyote, which in a patchy lore, both desirable and undesirable traits, like a human being. Coyote could be helpful or harmful, greedy or generous, good or bad, kind or unkind. This coyote, he was a was a um, a wily being, but in our tradition. He brought fire to the Apaches. He stole it from the flies, actually. So he did something good, but he was also quite uh, greedy and sneaky and untruthful and impulsive, impulsive. And these stories are often used to teach Apache moral codes and the ways in which the consequences of violating them. My grandfather was named Sam Houses. And he was born in the 1800s. He died in 1959. And he used to tell these stories to his kids and his grandkids. My older cousins, who were born before he passed away, uh, heard them. I never did, though. Never did. But um, I've read them from time to time. I can remember the first time I read a coyote story. Um, I was underwhelmed. I was like, What's, what's this? I'll tell you one real quick. Here's one. Um, one day, a coyote's walking along the road. He sees a rabbit. But the rabbit is actually a rabbit skin, rabbit skin full of rocks. Coyote pounces on it and bites it right in the middle and goes, ow, I thought that was a real rabbit. The end. That's it. I read that. I'm like, that's it? That's all there is? And later I found out they were told that these are taught in a sequence. So the next story, coyotes walking down the road, comes by a real rabbit. He goes, ah, I'm not going to mess with that, that stone rabbit anymore. And he, as he walks by, the rabbit bounces by, he chases it, and he doesn't get it. Which for a coyote is not a good thing because they need to eat rabbits to live. So these little stories that they tell, and they will tell them in a sequence. They're taught in a sequence. There might be a dozen. Well, not a dozen. There might be eight. Let's say these two stories. You know, they illustrate the importance of careful observation, understanding. They really have awareness and insight. So one can have the knowledge and the wisdom to discern whether an action will yield, will yield benefits or, or will, yield, will yield, yield suffering. So that before we act on an insti instinct or react based on an assumption, which may or may not be true, take some time to think about it. This is not different, not dissimilar from advice that Buddha gave to his son in the Sutta Turahula, 
where he said before you take an action, think it will cause harm, suffering, or, or, or benefit. And when you act, think is this causing harm or benefit. And after you act, reflect on whether it causes harm or benefit. So these simple stories relating the values that help us live life, our lives in a way that produce less harm, more freedom, more happiness. So I put together a little story tonight. It's kind of like a coyote story. It's kind of simple. Um, it's not deep dharma, not a bunch of lists, just one list. And as I was doing the compassion practice, I was thinking, well, maybe maybe I shouldn't use this list because maybe it's simpler than that. And I'll get to that. But the list are the eight worldly dharmas. These are the things that all human beings encounter in life, pleasure and pain, gain and loss, praise and blame, and fame and disrepute. And so often people seek the good side of the worldly dharmas, the happy side, the pleasure, the gain, the praise, the fame. And they suffer when they don't get it. Or they try to avoid the other side, the pain and the loss and the blame and disrepute. You know, the Buddha said that suffering can come from getting what you don't want or not getting what you do want or getting what you want and then having it disappear as things do because of impermanence. So my little coyote story tonight is about one person's suffering, my suffering in dealing with these problems and how an insight, a minor shift in perception occurred. And it helped me release a little bit of my clinging, a little bit of my version. And it provided just a little bit of liberation, a tiny liberation, any degree of liberation from my suffering. So my bio, I mentioned I was a tribal chairman. I actually uh, started meditating at Spirit Rock in 1996 and lived in the San Francisco until 2001 when the dot-com bubble burst. I hope I didn't get interrupted. I just got a call on my phone. I put it on mute. I, I'm, so let me start again. So in 2001, I moved from Oklahoma. I'm sorry, from, from San Francisco to Oklahoma to a garage apartment in my cousin's backyard in Apache, Oklahoma, population 1600. I wanted to get involved with my tribe, the Fort Sill Apaches, and their headquarters were there. It's the area where my dad was born. Our tribe is originally from Arizona and New Mexico, southeast Arizona, southwest New Mexico, and northern Mexico. Uh, but in 1886, they were made prisoners of war along with Geronimo. Uh, my grandfather was actually a, a young man at that time, a teenager. And they were moved to Florida, then Alabama, and finally to Oklahoma. Uh, they were held in for a total of 27 years, and in 1914 were released on farmland in Oklahoma. And so our tribal headquarters is maybe five miles from the place, the farmland where my father and my aunt grew up. And I moved there and uh, took a little while to get used to being in Oklahoma from, from San Francisco. Got involved with the tribe, and a year later, my aunt, who had been the tribe's chairperson, passed away. And I was elected to take her place. I'd been there a year. Now, Oklahoma used to be Indian country. I think it's still under license plates, uh, that name. And uh, it's a home of 38 tribes, but there were no reservations there. 
the native folks live dispersed amongst the, the general populace, the regular community. And only a quarter of um, our people even live near our tribal headquarters. Over half live outside the state. So after, um, after a year, not that long, I moved out of the garage apartment in my cousin's backyard to the nearby town of Lawton, Oklahoma, which is in southeast Oklahoma. It's where the military base Fort Sill is. My, my, our people, the people were kept. That's how they, they got their name, uh, or the tribe was named Fort Sill Apache. And I live next to white people, next to everybody, part of the community. I only saw members of my tribe when I was at work or at our casino, or occasionally Walmart, which is kind of a joke amongst Native folks. You go to Walmart and I always see another, another Indian there. But that's where I would see them. And when I was not at work, or doing tribal activities, I um, often, people would just consider me to be a white person because I'm a light-skinned mixed-race person. And I have lived in both worlds, passing as a white person for some time, and then in, in, in the native world, and sometimes really trying to, and self-conscious about whether or not I'm, I'm native enough. But... You know, the experience of being a mixed race person and really not knowing your home can be a challenge sometimes. It's a bit hard. At the beginning, I really missed California. Almost every day I was on monster.com trying to find a job back in California. But I couldn't find anything. After five years, I gave up and I accepted that my fate was to be a tribal chairman in Oklahoma. And also I thought, you know, I can't just walk away. I can't just walk away. Because an election is like a, it's like a marriage. It's a public uh, demonstration of loyalty and support. So it's not like quitting a job. And, but that actually took me five years. I was there for five years before I, I let go of that clinging to my past life and desire to return. And around that same time, I started to get more more involved with uh, the cultural side of our tribe. We're a small tribe. We only have 800 people. And um, we don't have any native speakers because when they were released from prison, there were only 80 people. And they were uh, worried that they were um, could be related to one another. So only two Apaches married each other at the time. And then later in the 90s, another two married. Otherwise, they married either Comanche Indians who lived in the area or white people like my dad. So a children, a tribe would grow up in a home where the parents didn't speak the language. It wasn't a, a, something that a person could pick up. And the language died out. Um, we did have a dance group, though. And I was invited to sing with a dance group. Now, our tribe has one primary dance. It's known as the Gan Dance or the Crown Dance or the Dance of the Mountain Spirits or simply the Fire, fire Dance because it's conducted around a fire. And um, our, we have it at social events, like an annual dance, but it's also a ceremony used at puberty rites, rites and attempts to heal the, Hill, heal the ill. And it was said to have been given to our people, the, the myth, the origin story of this dance, starts with a blind boy and a boy that can't walk who are lost in the homelands in the old days. And they were left behind. And the blind boy carried his friend trying to find their people. But they were out of food. And eventually, he got tired, and they just sat down on the side of a mountain, awaiting their fate, waiting to die. And they sat there for four days. Four is a sacred number in, in our culture. Four, four days. And then something happened. The mountain opened up, an opening in the mountain appeared. And Apaches living inside greeted them and took them in. Inside the world was just like the world outside. And these Apaches gave the boys food and nursed them back to health. And then they healed their disabilities. 
So that the blind one could see and the one that couldn't walk was able to walk. And they conducted a dance, a four-day ceremonial dance, where the men wore wooden headdresses and masks and painted their bodies and wooden skirts and would dance around the fire. And after four days, they said, you've got to go back to your people now. And the boys said, how can we possibly thank you for healing us? And the Apache people said, we are actually gods called Gahe, mountain spirits. We live in these mountains. And our role is to protect your people. So if you will go back and teach them this ceremony, so in times of trouble, when you're in need, if you perform this dance, we'll come protect you and heal you. Now, I offered the compassion meditation tonight because I think of this story. I think about how these gods in the mountains saw these suffering boys and took them in and healed them. You see a suffering being who desire to help them arises naturally. And the dance is used for healing. It's an act of compassion. It's an act of compassion. It's our ceremonial compassion. So like we went through the guided meditation, Apaches will perform this dance. I also would like to think about the story about the Buddha and his awakening. And after his awakening, he spent some time contemplating whether or not it was worth the trouble to teach the Dharma to human beings. And Brahma, who was the head of the gods in that time, saw that. He knew what the Buddha was thinking and instantly came down and persuaded him, begged him, pleaded him to teach the Dharma because Brahma was concerned that humanity would perish. Humanity would suffer without these teachings and the similarity of these deities reaching down and offering a teaching to us so we can use it. I love that similarity. So that's kind of the myth about it. Early dance groups were started by Apaches um, who they, they'd be fleeing danger, running out in the wilderness, running, running, running. This is mountainous country fleeing from a, an enemy, and then they would run into a big wall, a cliff. They couldn't pass it. And they were so tired that all they could do was lie down and go to sleep. And in their dreams, the Gahe came, and they taught them the ceremonies. And the men would go back to their people, and they would have the particular designs that they painted on their dancers, the particular style of their headdresses. They were taught to them, and then these dances would would be, that's how they would be conducted. That's how it actually came to the people in that way. So as I said, it's a, it's a social dance. And I discovered that, that um, I really liked it. I really liked it. It was a place where I really felt I was included. I was part of the place. I, I was singing Apache songs. And so it starts, we have this annual dance, and our people come from all over the country. We have a big bonfire in the center of the dance grounds. It's six feet tall, it's a huge bonfire. And when the sun goes down, the singers enter the dance ground carrying our drums. These are metal stock pots with water in the bottom and leather on top. And it's got a real deep sound, a boom, boom, boom. And um, then the dancers come, and before they before they actually conduct the dance, they perform a little ritual addressing the fire for each of the, each of the four cardinal directions, east and south and west and north. Always, always be twice. And for three hours, they will dance in a circle around this fire. And let's see how much time we have. I have a little bit of a recording. Um, the one thing about the traditional Apache ways is, are that the men perform these things. The women 
the women didn't sing or dance. That's kind of the way it was then. Um, but my grandparents recorded a song of the fire dance in 1954. And I've got that. And I actually mixed in myself singing. So I'd like to just uh, see if we can play maybe a minute or so of this song, just so you can get a feel for this dance. Okay, that's that's good. So that first part doesn't contain words. I can do that pretty well. That's the second part's in Apache and, and and that's hard. And the second part they're usually speaking to the um there's a hero story of a, a being that made the world safe for Apaches. And they're just speaking to that. But the idea of the song that came to us just to free us, to to help our people when they're suffering is such a beautiful thing to me. And so this dance goes on for an hour and a half or so, and then they switch dance groups and and um I think I like I like it and I like to talk about it because it's about community. It's about community. And for people of color and for people in tribes, community is so important. So important. You know, before I moved to Oklahoma, I didn't know my community. And then when I went there, I was in this community. It was such a deep and powerful thing. And when we come together in a retreat or in a sitting group, we're conducting a ceremony. You know, on a retreat, we start with the refuges. And then we, and in a way, it's sanctifying that place. It's signifying that ceremony is about to begin, to begin, that this is a sacred ceremonial time. Just like the dance when they're addressing the fire. This is not any time. This is a sacred ceremonial time. So the meditation group or the retreat will begin with the ceremony and then we conduct the, the ritual. Together we sit, even though we're silent in our own spaces. We're together. We're together. So that is one area that I have found that really connects me to both worlds. And so I was the chairman of the tribe from 2002 into, until the end of 2018, but then I got into a conflict with some of the other leaders on the tribe. Now, when I got there early on, I got into conflict and we tried to throw each other out. And it was a bitter, ugly thing. We ended up in court against each other. At the time, I was kind of, um, I was up for a fight, I guess, and, and uh, ready to defend my position. But this time, I'm like, I, I don't want to do it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do it. And besides, I'm in teacher training, and I kind of like to be a Dharma teacher. So I want to, I'll step away. I'll step away. So I left in 2018. But after a few months, I realized that I think I'd made a mistake because I didn't like some of the things that my successor were, successors were doing. They were basically reversing a lot of the policies that we had. You know, we'd been trying to build a casino in New Mexico. And, um, you know, as, a, as an individual or Buddhist, I understand greed and the problems with that, but as a kind of a head of us, head of state in this, in this regard, it was. Our responsibility to take care of our people and and a casino does that and so we were trying to 
those were in their homelands and have been doing it. Our people have been trying since 1999. And we've been in court for uh, several years with the federal government trying to get force them to do it. When I left, they fired the law firm and brought on somebody who lost the, the same thing, who lost the case before. So I filed for re-election in August of 2019 and um, started telling people that, that, they, that I would do a better job than the folks who had succeeded me. Um, and we had a meeting and the, the chairperson told people that I had spent million dollars, millions of dollars on this law firm without telling anybody. And it was a complete falsehood, completely wrong. And I'm like, I'm sure people believe this, right? Right? Um, but they didn't. They didn't. I. It was a tough race. Politics is a tough thing. It's hard to be in the Dharma and politics at the same time. Because there's so much cleaning. But um, the results came in October 2019. I look, I get a text. And I'm like, oh, I got the same number of votes as I did before. Ah. I look at the second line and the incumbent, my opponent beat me by 20 votes and everything just crumbled. So much of my identity had been tied into this. For four, several months, four months, probably four months, every night, all I could do was binge watch crime TV, British crime TV detective shows. It's the only thing that could take my mind off my loss. I thought my career was dead, you know, it's gone. Um, First, it was I had won nine elections in a row, and I lost this one. And it was devastating. But and then the, the pandemic came, so I completed teacher training and taught some retreats, taught some meditation groups, and um, enrolled in a Master of Fine Arts program at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. My uncle was a sculptor and an early teacher there. And uh, I thought it was a good legacy. And I wanted to learn, I wanted to write a memoir. It came to me during the political race. I'm like, well, Obama wrote a memoir. That helped him to write a memoir. Um, so I signed up for, to write a memoir, but I'm still kind of clingy, right? Um, but I, I actually enrolled uh, this year. And I moved away from Oklahoma to our tribal homelands. This place called the Cochise Stronghold, which is a beautiful canyon where an Apache chief called Coach Chiefs lived, his, lived out his final years. He negotiated to have a reservation built, put here, or established here, which is very unusual. They're usually dictated and natives are told, this is going to be a reservation. But he said, I want to live here. And uh, they, the, the government agreed to it. Um, in, uh, I live in a little cabin in this canyon. In my backyard are these gigantic boulders going up to cliffs a thousand feet above. Granite, pink granite all around. It's quiet. A great place to write. Great place to contemplate. I thought everything was behind me, but I saw a video. I, I, I'd actually been, I, I got on a self-retreat in a cabin nearby before I bought the cabin I have. And I saw this, there had been a tribal meeting and they had criticized the legal team. I got mad. I got angry. How dare they? The vicissitudes, the worldly dharmas, pleasure and pain, blame, disrepute. How dare they? And some people called me, you should run again. You should run again. And I'm like, like the, the race was coming up this October. I consulted an astrologer. And this may sound weird to you, and it's a long story. But in 1994, I went to her for the first time. And she um, told me about my past lives, which I thought was crazy because at the time I was an atheist. She also said, you should start meditating. In 1996, I did. And that's, that's why I'm here, because the Dharma really has been a big part of my life. And so I talked to her every now and then, and she said, You're, I'm going through a Pluto trans, Saturn transit. I don't know if anybody knows what that means. If you do, it's scary. It's um, 
often signify the death. And she said, you're, you're going through a death and rebirth process. And you try to go back to your old life and it will be slaughtered. It will be slaughtered. What you need to do is write and learn to speak from your heart, regardless of the opinions of others. That was the life lesson she told me in, back in 94. So I came to the canyon and started working on my essays. Beautiful solitude. I was the first Apache back in the canyon since 1874 when our people were removed. And then I realized I'm the only Apache here. Everybody else is white. And I kind of miss being home. And then writing was a struggle. My teacher would say, start your essay with a problem and at the end you solve it. And I kept coming back to the same problem, how I'd been done wrong. I've been done wrong. And um, so my last assignment, the teacher said, I think you, you, I really want you to share yourself, not just describe the beautiful canyons, but share yourself. And he gave me this braided essay. And a braided essay is an essay where you intersperse your own writing with outside things. So it might be, um, instructions on how to do something and then an essay and then instructions on how to do something and and the elements are supposed to tie into each other so i thought you know i want to i want to use that transcript from that session i had in in april with the astrologer and my and really the, the transit she was talking about is hitting a wall you, at, at this time in my life i look and reassess what i've done i'm cannot move forward and just change and look and see how I can change these things. So I thought, hitting a wall, hmm, that story about how the fire dance originated when the when the, the Apache ran into the cliff. I'm going to start writing about that. I wrote this lengthy description of the dance, of my last dance, 2017, before I resigned and how I felt so connected to my community. And when I wrote that dance, that feeling of connection arose again. I, I actually cried when I was writing it. I didn't realize just how much I'd missed the community. You know, I'd been caught up in the in the business administration and being a being a, the chief. That just that thing really, really stuck with me. And then I put together the, the next piece, which is a transcript. I'm trying to figure out. Where do you go from there? And in my mind's eye appeared the image of a cocoon. Now, what do you think when you think of a cocoon? Cocooned in cotton, cocooned in a, I looked it up, cocooned in a down comforter, soft and safe, comfortable. It's a, you know, it's like an incubator for a butterfly. The first thing I thought was that poor dead caterpillar. I mean, I started thinking, what is a, what is a cocoon? It's a caterpillar coffin before it becomes a, a, a butterfly incubator. And I remember the caterpillar's bodies, they go into the cocoon, they're entirely dissolved, entirely dissolved. And, um, I thought about that. I looked it up as is interesting. And what I found out was that not everything dissolves when this caterpillar digests itself inside of the cocoon. There's these little tiny building blocks, tiny building blocks that survive and become the foundation of the body of the butterfly or the moth that will later emerge, this new being. You know, the caterpillar is gone. It no longer exists. When humans go, when humans no longer exist, they're dead. Nothing ever comes back. We're animals. And living, ugly living beings no longer exist. Nothing ever comes back. But this liquid, it's called caterpillar soup, contains the essence of life, the potential for life. It's not dead. And 
I had this insight that my own life and the career that I thought, it wasn't dead. It was caterpillar soup. It was caterpillar soup. I had been grieving a death. I had been clinging and the desire to return to an old life, not recognizing that even though I am currently in a cocoon, in a liquid suspended state, I'm alive. They are not a liquid suspended state, but part of me feels like it. My career feels like it. I felt like it. And so I had been blinded, blinded by the trauma of my loss, and all I could see was the loss. I couldn't see the potential. Ooh. And so basically, this, this little coyote tail, caterpillar tail, is to remind you that no matter what happens, no matter what you encounter, no matter, no matter how difficult things may seem, there's always the potential for happiness, always. And it also helps to let go of your suffering and your clinging. And that's the biggest gift I got from this insight was that I had been clinging to what I thought was a dead, something dead and in my hands and in front of me was the potential for a new and beautiful life. So I got a, something flashed up. It said there'll be announcements in three minutes. But um, thank you for your attention and your time. And I know this is a little bit, you know, I was wondering, because it's not real Dharma, but then there's, you know, for me, it's like, I see how I've been clinging, and I'm so happy for this insight. And, you know, they say the insights arise on the cushion when you've been sitting, and you're in, you're in a deep, deep practice, but sometimes they can arise in your life, and if you can time to see them, and reflect on them, you may find something valuable. Thank you. Yeah, well, I don't have any, um, any recommendations. That's a I don't have any recommendations. I I hope that um, I hope that if something arises, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. I um, you know, I certainly have compassion for the suffering of the of of African Americans and the and difficulties, but um, you know if. If, um, yeah, the, you know, our people never return to their own land. I'm the only one right here, at least the only one from our tribe. Um, but yeah, to be away from your home, to be disconnected is such a thing. And I think the only the only answer from, from a Dharma perspective is to find that home in our heart and that home of compassion and of, and of caring. So I thank you for your question. It's an auspicious thing that we would take an evening, a few hours to practice meditation together. It creates merit. And so this practice of sharing the merit, close your eyes, take a deep breath, feel your body breathing. So 
sometimes I think of my ancestors here when I offer merit. If there's any being you would like to offer merit to, bring them to mind. While I say these phrases, may the merit that we may have generated in our practice tonight be shared with these beings and all beings in all worlds, in all directions. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free from suffering. And may all beings awaken. So happy to spend the time with you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening.